Please turn to your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meats and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness now these things were our examples to the intense we would we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted neither be ye idolaters as were some of them as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day 3 and 20000 Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in his samples, and they, were, they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Um, now Mr. Griffith is going to come. Oh, Hebrews. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, there's another part. It's Hebrews chapter 3, verses um, 7 to 15. And the Bible reads, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do away, they they do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be if in any of you an evil hearts of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the ends. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Tried in vain a thousand ways, my fears to quell, my hopes to raise. But what I need, the Bible says, is ever only Jesus. My soul is night. My heart is still, I cannot see, I cannot feel, for light, for life, I must appeal in simple faith to Jesus. He died, he lives, he reigns, he pleads. should sneer and some should blame I'll go with all my guilt and shame I'll go to him because his name above all names is Jesus Jesus 
The song that Mr. Griffith just sung is an expression of someone who understands the wickedness and the deceitfulness of his heart and was prepared to trust the Lord Jesus Christ in a real conversion, a transformation, a passing from death to life. I don't think there's anyone here this morning who even comes close to being that heart set awareness, the awareness of the truth, but rather you are in a state of the deceitfulness of sin. And that's the subject of my message this morning. You see, from this pulpit, behind this desk, every week, morning and evening, and throughout the week, we talk about the salvation, the good news that's available through the atonement, the death of Christ on the cross, his shed blood, his resurrection that brings life. But it falls flat on lost people's ears. Now, there's no one within the confines of these four walls that is so strident to say, I will not have Christ. I do not believe he died for me. I know that I'm a sinner. You see, people in this room are deceived. You're not like the man who Mr. Griffith sung about, whose testimony was his heart is dark, his heart is steel. I can't come to Christ, but I must. You're not like that. And neither are you the people outside these walls who say, I don't want to be a Christian. You're in between. You entertain the thought that you will become a Christian. You entertain the thought that I'm not so bad. And so I must address that lie this morning. That deceitful heart bent this morning. The Bible clearly teaches that the Jewish people are God's chosen people. But what do I mean by that? It means God chose them to be his people. That God chose them to reveal himself to them. And that through them, they can bless all the nations of the world. This is a theme I repeat time and time again. Because the scriptures remind us time and time again. There are three main ways that God used his chosen people to be a blessing to all the world. So that we can know the one true and living God. So, get, so that we can receive the holy scriptures, the Bible, the self-revelation of God. So that through the Bible, we can know, know more specifically about God. More than that he's just one true and living, but we can know more about his nature. We can know, know more about our being created and the world and the universe. We can know more about God's economy and where man fits in that economy. And we can especially know that we are sinners under great judgment by the law of God. So number one, the Jews have shown us there's one true and living God. Number two, the scriptures and last, humanly speaking, we receive, the world has received the Messiah, the Savior of the world through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now in the passage that Jesse just read this morning, it talks about the Jews. But it talks about them in a very negative light. And unfortunately, much of the Bible speaks of the Jews because they reflect man in a negative light. 
It shows that in the period of time that we call their wilderness wanderings. And what does that mean? God, through Moses, delivered them from bondage in Egypt land. They cried out to God. And God heard them, heard their cries, raised up Moses, the deliverer, to deliver Israel out of Egypt. And between Egypt and the promised land was the wilderness. And they traveled in that wilderness for 40 years. And during that time, we learned a lot about the Jews, which again are a reflection of us. They did not do so well. They tempted God. And they murmured against God. They committed fornication as the people of God. And God judged them and sent fiery serpents. But God in his mercy, as a type of Christ, created a brazen serpent. And if they were to look, they were to live. You see, time and time again in the Bible, in Old and New Testaments, we read that the people of Israel are cited time and time again. Everyone look up, please. Time and time again regarding the sin, the complaining, the unthankfulness, the inner depravity of man in the wilderness wanderings. God was gracious. God was loving. God was forgiving. God gave them chance and chance again. But they sinned and sinned again. They were presumptuous. They thought they were the people of God. They thought that God would give them another chance. Their heart was deceived. Because ultimately, God drew a line that they crossed. And he swore on his wrath, they will not enter into my rest. They will not enter Jordan, which is a type, a picture of salvation. Now, in the two passages that Jesse read, there's two parts to it. Let me just bring it to focus. In the first passage, it talks about their multiple sins. Outline them and detail them. And in the end, Paul said, Now all these things, what they did in God's mercy, all these things happened unto them for examples, sample cases for us to learn how not to do things. And they are written for our admonition, for our warning. I told you the people of Israel, chosen of God. God revealed themselves to them, his own people, to be a blessing to the nation. But they did not receive their chosenness, their specialness after having been chosen as something important. And so when they're sin, they represent you. And so Paul is saying here that what I've written here and throughout the Old Testament and the New is written for an example not to follow. And a warning for you not to do what they did. Lest the result that they had, the judgment, will fall on you. And so my text develops that. Please put it on the screen. Hebrews 3, 12 and 13. Begins with a warning. Take heed, brethren. Lest there be in any of you. I believe the writer was the Apostle Paul. It's debatable. But as he's writing to the Hebrews, he says, brethren, and then he says, lest there be in any of you. He's talking to a mixed crowd. Some were saved. Some thought, some had meant to believe in Jesus, but thought that the works of their law would save them. And so they were not saved. He's speaking to a mixed crowd. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. In departing from the living God. Pardoned through the deceitfulness of sins. I have three points for you this morning. First, the deceitfulness, the deceitfulness of sin stems, originates from your own evil heart. An evil heart of unbelief. Pardoned through the deceitfulness of sins. The scriptures, the Bible throughout, from beginning to end, describe the wickedness, the evilness of the human heart. Look up, please. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to everyone. 
the evilness, the wickedness of the human heart. But it also speaks of the subtleness, of the desperateness, of the deception, the trickiness of the human heart. What does deceitful mean? Deceitful means clever. It means delusively glamorous and sophisticated. Those are trickeries that beautify sin. You see, it's the opposite of truth. Truth, seen in the light of scripture or through the eyes of God, sees sin as being exceedingly sinful. That's what the purpose of the law of God is, to reveal to the heart of man that you, your heart, is exceedingly sinful. That's the truth. But your heart is deceptive. And so you don't believe that. Rather, you believe cleverly that you just make a mistake. You're not perfect, after all. That sins are glamorous and are attractive, and I want some of that. And it's sophisticated. Only boring people follow Christ and our religion. I want a life. I don't want to be stuck in a local church doing the same thing, talking about Christ. I want sophistication. I want some change. I want variety. I want the spice of life. That, those are lies that your own heart tells yourself. You see, man's sinful and deceitful heart makes it nay impossible except the grace of God for you to respond to the gospel. And that's why week after week, though the gospel is preached as clear as I can, yet very little results commence from that. I have some people after the service who want to talk to me. They have flashes of light and truth. But as soon as they walk out the door, they deceive themselves again, and they're okay. They're in the world. They're in a safe place. And after the preaching, they get some light. The deceitfulness is lifted. But again, you revert back. You degrade back to deception. And so there is no awakening, no conversion, no testimony of what Mr. Griffith sung about. No thought at all. That something, anything is wrong with your heart. That you are torn. You want Christ, but you can't. None of this. Comfortable in your deceit. Throughout the Bible, not only wickedness and evilness, but to top off that deceit. Can't get to the core truth of where you're at. And so Paul tells the Christians. See, a Christian is not a perfect person, but he has a new nature. He has the Holy Spirit within. He still contends with his old spirit. But there's a battle. So Paul tells the church in Rome, be wise to do good and simple concerning evil. He exhorts them to have wisdom to do good things. But be simple to do evil things. But what about you who are lost? Quite the opposite, is it not? You're very sophisticated in doing sin, planning it all out. How are you going to do something? But to do good, you never think about it. And this evil, this wickedness, this deception is not only true for some people, but it's true for everyone. It's true for everyone. People entertain themselves cajole themselves, trick themselves, deceive themselves to think, I'm not like other men. Certainly that's your position. You might think, yeah, there are some people that are bad, but I'm not so bad. Me, my family, my friends, we're not so bad. No, you're deceiving yourself. You might be okay compared to other people, but the standard is God, who is your judge. Deception Running through the ranks of all men, all people created, were born that way. How do you express it? You might express it in a very polite way, in a very sociological acceptable way. 
I'm just a young person. I just want to be a student. I just want to make some money. I just want to excel in life. Sounds very proper and very good. But that person deceives themselves to think that they want Christ. Many people like that. So self-deceived. I want forgiveness. I have a sin. I need to have forgiveness. I don't want judgment. But I don't want all that is attached to that. And so you deceive yourself. I'm not that bad. I just need a little tweaking, you see. I'm not a, I'm not a bad sinner. I, yes, I do some sins. But I'm better than the rest. And I'm very close to the kingdom of God. Just a little tweaking. But that discipleship stuff, no, no, no. That's not for me. That's not sophisticated. That's not glamorous. And you've deceived yourself and ambition and professionalism and materialism is your God. There's someone like that this morning. And he thinks he's very close to the kingdom of God. No, you're deceived. You are as far as the kingdom of God as from a camel going through the eye of a needle. And then above all scriptures, the prophet, the prophet Jeremiah said it so clearly. And pay attention to what he says. It's well known by all of you, but absorb it. The heart is deceitful above all things. Nothing supersedes your deceitful heart. Nothing. The heart is deceitful above all things. You've met people who deceive themselves. Thought they were some great person. That thought they were some great intellect. Had a great voice. Very, very beautiful. Very good in basketball. Or whatever the case may be. Very full of themselves. Very self-deceived. And you thought that person is really full of himself. Well, let me tell you. There is nobody that's more full of yourself than you. The heart is deceitful above all things. Nobody can surpass you in deceiving whom? Deceiving yourself. What good would that do? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Not only are you deceitful above all things, but you're desperately wicked. You want to express your wickedness. And like a drug addict, you have to get your fix. You're desperate. You'll do anything to express your wickedness. Again, it may come in a very polite manner. I just want my own quiet life. I just want to handle my own affairs. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just keep to myself. You're deceiving yourself because you've sinned against God. Where's God in all your conversation? No, you're idolatrous and that's a great sin. You see, that is a sin that explains all sin. The, heartful, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Least of all you. You don't know your heart. You don't know how wicked you are. Deceived you are. And that's why by the grace of God. A man can say and feel. What Mr. Rivet just sung. That takes the grace of God. To cut through that deception. To see that his heart is steel. To see he can't feel his sin. But must. He knows he must have Christ. He knows he's tricked himself again and again and again. God has shown him as some come to me after the service. I need Christ. And here I go again. I want Christ. But I've deceived myself again. When are you going to come to the end of yourself and see that you're steeped in deception? You're desperately wicked. You're deceitful above all things, and you don't even know it. You're clueless. And the only hope for you is to let the word of God, through the spirit of God, reprove you. And let God convince you and convict you. And that's the only way that you will come to the point that you are a candidate for Christ and see your need for Jesus. There's others 
that think my religion will save me. I'm, you see, you don't understand. I'm of a different religion. And you've tricked yourself. You've tricked yourself to think it's your religion. It's a pretext. I find that most people say that you see I'm of a different religion. Most times it has nothing to do at all with their religion. It's a convenient excuse not to partake in Christ's religion. What is a person to say? Okay, that's my preference. That's my prerogative. And that's supposed to shut the preacher up. Have nothing more to say. And your heart is deceived. But you need to see when you say I'm a different religion. It has nothing to do at all about your religion. Nothing to do at all. Perhaps to some degree, if you were a priest, perhaps to some degree, you really believe that your religion can save you like Martin Luther. Perhaps if you were a priest, perhaps if you were a nun, if perhaps if you were a monk, perhaps, perhaps if you were to go in the desert and wear sackcloth and ashes, perhaps then you believe to some degree that your religion can save you. But all the talk, that's not my religion. It's all a front, a deception, sophistication, trickery. That's not the problem. The problem is you want to live your life. You don't want any attachments of discipleship. Or following what Christ says to make him Lord. The list goes on and on. But point two. Look at the screen, please. Second, God's warning that the deceitfulness of sin will harden your heart and lead to your departure from God and the local church. You see, that deceitful heart has a destination. As your heart remains deceived in sin and wickedness, and when the gospel truth, look up, please. Try to pay attention. I realize that there are some who can look up and pretend to listen. And merely by looking up doesn't mean you're paying attention. But at least be consistent with what I'm saying. If you're looking down and don't want to look up, then you are conspicuously being self-deceived. So please process and think. There's a reason why you that are here, that are lost, and most of you who are lost know you're lost. There's a reason why that you remain lost. And has nothing to do with what you think. Remember, your heart is self-deceived. Deceived above all things, desperately wicked. You don't know it. You think, I wonder why. For some, it's a clear case of not wanting to make Christ the Lord and being a disciple. But even then, that person or those people think that's not the problem. Even though it is the problem, they will not think that. So the underlying root of the problem, because we have to deal with the root. If you don't deal with the root and you deal with the covering, then you don't go to the problem and your heart will not be convinced of sin and your deceptiveness. And you won't give up. You won't say, Lord, take me. Jesus, take me. I'm helpless. I'm hopeless. I deceive myself again and again. Help me to pay attention. Help me to be serious. Help me not to trick myself. Because that's all I'm capable of doing, to trick myself. So why did God judge his people in the wilderness? I told you they're a type and example. Was it because he didn't love them? No. He loved them very much. Is it because he didn't have patience with them? No. He had patience with them very much. Is it because he never forgave them? No. He forgave them much. But every time... They sinned and God had mercy and delivered them. Their heart went back to deception. 
You see, it goes back. Your heart goes back like the person after a sermon that I talked to and has a blush of conviction of sin and say, I need Christ. They leave the room as if they'd never heard a sermon. And so to you, you have to allow God to speak to you or you will, despite the example, despite the warning that God gives you in his word time and time again, you will fulfill what your human heart of deception will control. Unless you allow God to reach you, to speak to you, to humble yourself, and not to say, no, that's not me. You need to say, yes, that is me. Yes, save me. Yes, speak to me. Because if not, I will go back to my deceitful heart, and I will be judged and sent to hell and the lake of fire. Just like the people of Israel. What path do you want to follow? That's what the question is. Don't repeat their mistake. What is the purpose of preaching? You have this deceitful heart. That's deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked. Who can know it? What's the purpose of preaching? What's the purpose of the law? I said so before. I'll say it again. That your sin. That you cleverly hide. And deceive yourself. Might become in your own heart and eyes. Exceedingly sinful. Paul said that sin by the commandment. The law might become exceedingly sinful. Romans 7.13. Because only if you're convinced. That your heart is not just a little sinful, but exceedingly sinful. So sinful that I can barely grasp that I'm that sinful. That I quickly deceive myself. I thought before, I'm guilty of sin. I'm going to hell. The Bible is right, but does not last? And unless you're given a surplus of an awareness of your sinfulness, 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 sinfulness. So much so that the deceitfulness of your heart does not lessen it enough so that the sin is ever before you. That's the purpose of preaching in the law of God. To have sin to be ever before you, you, you want to get rid of it. Get out of my way, sin. I don't want to think about it. You deceive yourself. To try to get the sin out from in front of you. But if the law of God creates in you and your heart and your feeling the exceeding sinfulness, the mount and weight of sin that is yours, that any deception that your heart brings in the net still resounds exceeding sinful. When God illuminates the scriptures through the preaching and his law, you will remain exceedingly sinful in the eyes of God. And sin will be ever before you. You can't escape. You need to want it. I can't explain it. God is sovereign. But you have a will. You have a, a willingness to melt and to be taught of God, they shall be taught of God to come to Christ. You don't want to learn, okay? Then you won't be taught of God. When God tells you, his Bible is right. I'm exceedingly sinful. I don't see my sins exceeding sinful. And you say, I don't want to hear that. I won't receive that. Then you won't be taught of God. And you can't come to Christ. Because that's how God does it. He works in you to will and to do his good pleasure by wooing you, by controlling you, by convincing you. Brother Ruth will talk about using the conscience, perhaps God may use. But you have, in some sense, a kind of omnipotence to resist God, but only in this manner to the destruction of your soul. What power this power that I wish you didn't have. Power only to destroy, to self-destruct, I should say. 
because your heart is full of sin. You must defer to the will of God as he speaks to you. Third and last, the deceitfulness of sin will ultimately lead to your eternal judgment. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Many of you every week depart from the living God. You do it again and again. God comes down to his wall, tells you you need Christ. Depart from me. I don't, want, I don't want the knowledge of God. You do that week after week. Because you obey your deceitful heart. But just like the people of Israel. The apple of his eye. Who God gave a limit. He limited a certain day. And he did that to the people of God. The apple of his eye. What do you, what do you think he will do with you? Should he be more gracious to you? Who are not his own. Think men. These. The people of Israel. Their accounts. Their sample cases are written. To warn you. Don't follow in their steps. If you continually depart. From the living God as they did. There was one day. When God swore in his wrath. No more. I limit it. They passed the limit. And except for Joshua and Caleb, they did not enter the promised land, a picture, a type of redemption. It did not end well for them. Will it end up better for you? Will you listen to the sermon? Will you listen to the warning about your deceitful heart? How you will trick yourself. How will you afford yourself? How you will dress up sin to make it glamorous, deluding yourself? You see, the Bible is preached, but it has to go through the prism, the lens of your own heart, and how much you change the message. Law is preached, but by the time it enters your heart, it's so corrupted and so deceived and so changed that you come away thinking, well, there's some truth to that, but in the main, I'm doing okay. I'll just come to church when it's convenient. I'll hear it again. I'll, I'll get saved someday. Deceitful heart. That's the path of destruction and judgment. Let me tell you, there are three things that go against your salvation. One is your own deceitful heart. That goes back, goes back, departs from the living God. The other is the age in which we live. We live in the last days, the age of deception. And one day Satan will use the Antichrist. And the Bible says all deceivableness. Of unrighteousness in them that perish. Because they receive not the love of the truth. Do not receive Christ. That they might be saved. You are already self-deceived. We live in an age of deception. On top of the deception that your heart already has. That I don't need Christ. I'm not so bad. I'll trust Christ someday. On top of that. Layer on top of that. What the Antichrist will give you. More deception. And more deception. And then last. I told you there's three. Is your heart of deception. There is the devil. Using the Antichrist. And there is God himself. Who's your, who can become your enemy. I quote from what he told the people of Israel. He told them. They do always err. They do always sin. So I swear in my wrath. They shall not enter into my rest. Your window is short. Your heart is deceived. Thinking you're okay. You're wicked. You're evil. Yet you deceive yourself. You don't want to believe the truth in God's word that it's true. You believe a lie. That's where your inherent bent to believe a lie. And on top of that, the spirit of this age. And then when God sets a limit, it's all over. You are a deceitful person. What hope do you have? 
Let me tell you what the Lord Jesus, in such a pointed way, has done for you that are lost. You have a deceitful heart of sin. But what does the Bible say regarding Jesus? Listen to it very carefully. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 9, He, Jesus, made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. You who are so deceitful, you who are so sinful, you who trick yourself again and again, Christ died for that amalgamation of sin, and he is so opposite from you. You are deceitful, yet he has no deceit in his mouth. You are wicked, and he is pure. You are unrighteous, and he is holy. And so Christ, as the perfect substitute for your sin, died on the cross. The just Jesus for the unjust you, including your deception. The Holy One of God nailed to the cross to pay for your sin. To wash your sins away. To give you a new heart so that you no longer have to live a life of deceit, trickery. Where you can follow Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. You have another opportunity this morning. Will you squander it away? Will you let your deceitful heart trick yourself yet again? Or will you come to the knowledge of the truth? Will you come to Christ? Do you sense your sins must be forgiven? Do you sense that there must be truth in the inward hearts? Are you tired of the deceit any longer? Will you admit to God it's only deceit and lie and wickedness? God, cleanse me. Give me truth in my inward parts. Make me clean. I need Jesus. If that's the cry of your heart, and you're done deceiving yourselves, tricking yourself, and you simply come as a convinced sinner without qualifications, that you come to Christ, be washed in his blood, follow him as disciple in the local church, as evidence of your sincerity of trust in Christ. And that's your opportunity. God, look at... Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh at the heart. Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, I pray that thou wouldest bless the message this morning. Lord, we pray that thou wouldest cut through the deceit, the trickery, the wickedness, the evil of lost people's hearts this morning. That thy spirit would convince them the truth. That they are a guilty sinner. We need a new heart that only Christ can provide. Help them to come. Help one to come this morning as a guilty, convinced sinner, trusting thy son. Be willing to live for him and be saved this morning. Lord, bless the food they're about to receive in our fellowship together. We thank thee for thy presence, thy power. Today, we ask all these things in Jesus' name.